My topic tonight is how to bury the past and experience life at its best. Have you ever wished that the past could be gone? Have you ever wished that you could begin life all over again? I want to begin our journey tonight in one of the most amazing, the one of the most fascinating places in all the world. Come with me to Cappadocia in Turkey. Cappadocia has unusual land formations. It's an area where the rain and the wind over the centuries has carved out very unusual caverns, very unusual castle-like formations that are all natural. During the Middle Ages, this was an area that Christians fled from the persecutions of the Romans. It was a place of refuge for the persecuted. And so they dug into these porous cliffs, these cone-like and at times mushroom-like structures. They dug into them. And there were thousands of Christians living here as a place of refuge. This was an asylum for the hunted. And you can see the remnants of a previous generation of where people lived in these tower-like structures that are all carved out naturally. When the persecutions got quite fierce, when the Romans extended their long arm down to the Cappadocia region, or when at times the Muslim invaders came through this region, these Christians had underground cities. And it was in these underground cities that they would hide for at times up to six months or nine months. The underground cities would have secret passageways cut into the mountains. These underground cities went down eight stories, nine stories. Some of them went down 12 to 14 stories. And as many as 8,000 people lived underground. It was a network of underground cities. Sometimes they were connected by tunnels underground, and these tunnels at times went as many as two or three miles to connect a city of 6,000 underground with a city of eight or 10,000. We're on a journey of discovery. We want to learn how to bury our past, but I want to take you with me into one of these underground cities and discover an amazing truth that these early Christians believed was fundamentally part of Christian faith. And it's one of the most significant Bible truths today, although many churches have lost sight of it. So let's go down the network of corridors. Let's pass through these narrow passageways. You enter in, and then you begin going down quite deeply. My wife and I, in doing research for this series with a small group, were here this past summer. When you first begin going into the cities and you begin going underground and you go down these narrow passageways, if you have claustrophobia at all, this is not a place you want to go. But the reward is marvelous because as you go down five floors, six floors, and you sense that early Christians lived here for six months or nine months. There are places that you can see their kitchens, and, the, and you actually see the ash and the soot on the ceiling of the cave where they cooked. You can see places where they actually had their animals down underground. There are places that were carved in the rock for air passages. It's really quite amazing. My wife and my daughter are here about seven or eight stories down in this cave-like structure. Quite cold, so we had to be fairly well-dressed. I always carry a flashlight when I'm down that deep. You have no guide. You are there basically on your own. So if the lights go out, you want to be well-equipped. Again, if you are afraid of the dark, this is not the place for you. But the singing, we sang a mighty fortress is our God. We sang rock of ages and we thought of these early Christians. But there's something here I must show you. 
something that is so part of scriptural faith that if these early believers had to carve it out of the rock, here is a baptistry in one of the underground cities that is carved in the rock where these early believers practice baptism not by sprinkling, not by pouring, but by full immersion. There they wanted to declare their allegiance for Christ. And if some of the family were not baptized, they would fill these vats with water and baptize them by full immersion. From the time of Christ, for over 1,000 years, early Christians baptized by immersion. Let's go to Ephesus, some distance from Cappadocia. One day I was walking down the street of Ephesus, coming down this main street. Ephesus had about 150,000 people we, in, it, in its heyday. We came by the Celsus Library, went right over here, down past the stadium that's at 15 to 20,000. We were just going out, and I saw some ruins over in a pile of weeds. And as I was looking over at those ruins, because my curiosity got the best of me, I climbed over some ruins because I'm on a journey of discovery. I want to learn as much as I can about biblical truth, and particularly how the early church practiced baptism discovered that this particular church was a church dedicated in the 6th century, 600 years after Christ, to Mary, the mother of God. As I was climbing around the ruins, I saw this sign. I stopped. Baptistry for adult baptism, 6th and 7th century. We took that picture quickly. Our Roman Catholic friends, six to 700 years after Christ, were not baptizing babies. They were baptizing adults. I said, I've got to find that baptistry where the Roman Catholics baptized adults in full immersion, began climbing over rocks looking for it, and here we came to the baptistry. Do you see it? Carved out of the rock right here. They filled it with water, and our Roman Catholic friends baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit by immersion for at least 600 years. I traveled further from Ephesus traveled on a journey of discovery. Here is the early Christian church at Philippi, one of the earliest Christian churches erected there in Philippi. Again, what do you see? A baptism where Christians practice baptism not by sprinkling or by pouring, but by what? Full immersion. I said, I wonder, is there any evidence in Rome? So going to Rome, we went to St. John of Lateran. This is the second holiest church in Rome after St. Peter's Cathedral. If you go to Rome and you visit St. John of Lateran, you can go down a back alley. Going down that back alley, you see a octagonal shaped building, eight-sided building, and if you go in that building, you will discover a baptistry where again, our Roman Catholic friends practice baptism by full immersion of adult believers. But probably one of the ones that is most fascinating for me is this leaning tower of what? Pisa. Leaning, not pizza. Leaning tower of Pisa. You got it. Right behind it, there is the famous bell tower. And in this bell tower, there again is a baptistry where baptism was by immersion. For well over 1,000 years, the Christian church from the time of Christ down through the ages had one form of baptism only, and that was baptism by immersion. In fact, when in the former Soviet Union, in Kiev, capital of Ukraine, you look at St. Vladimir's Cathedral, the Russians and the Ukrainians celebrated a thousand years of Christianity not long ago. And when the Russian king was baptized, you have the artwork of the baptism of the Russian king, Vladimir the Great. He was baptized by immersion. Yet many churches today have discarded this biblical practice. Throughout the centuries, baptism by immersion has always been for adult believers. It's always been for young people and children as a public testimony of their inner commitment to Christ. When a believer says, I love Jesus, when a believer says, I want to follow the Word of God and I understand His Word and I understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ and a follower of Christ, when a believer makes that decision, they walk into the water and they're baptized. Baptism is a symbol of our loyalty. It's a symbol of our commitment. It's a symbol of our allegiance to Jesus Christ. You see, when we make a decision for Christ, Christ says, stand for me publicly. 
It's like saying, oh, I love my wife, but I don't love her enough to marry her. You see, marriage is a public commitment of a decision of two people to unite their lives together. Baptism is a public commitment of our desire to unite our life to Christ. People say, can I be baptized in secret? If I love Jesus enough, he calls me to be baptized in public. God leads us to make that decision, that commitment to him. Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, these are the last words of Christ. Last words are incredibly important. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism must be very important if it's part of a command of Christ to his disciples where he tells them, go to the ends of the earth. Baptism is not an elective course in Christianity. Baptism is at the very heart of what it means to make a commitment as a Christian. The Bible says, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus says to his disciples, go out and preach. When people accept Jesus, go out and teach. When they give their hearts to him, go out and share with them the gospel and teach them to observe everything I've commanded. And when they make that decision, baptize them. And I'm with you even to the end of the age. So tonight, when we have a baptism here, tomorrow morning and evening, when we have baptisms here, and all week as we have baptisms in this place, Jesus says, I am with you. When you step into the water of baptism, wherever you are, watching by television, watching in churches. Tonight at the end of this meeting, I'm gonna make an appeal for men and women to follow Christ in baptism. If you're in Orlando here tonight, you can lead that way. Wherever you are tonight, pray throughout this message that the Spirit of God will touch your heart. If you're in front of some television tonight, I'm gonna to make an appeal to you that you will come to Christ and make that decision to be baptized if you've never done it before. If you're watching in some church tonight, let the Spirit of God come upon you and make that decision for Jesus someplace tonight. Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus invites his disciples to, to invite people to follow him. Baptism is mentioned more than 80 times in the New Testament. If it's mentioned more than 80 times in the New Testament, it must be important. What do you say? But yet there are many people that say, how many, to, how many kinds of baptism are there? There are many who say, you know, sure, baptism is mentioned in the New Testament, but how many kinds are there? You see, when we're baptized, we declare our allegiance. Obviously, a baby doesn't have the ability to declare their allegiance to Christ. When we're baptized, we take a public stand. When we're baptized, we tell whose side we are on. When we're baptized, we say, Jesus, I am declaring for you. But how many methods of baptism are there? Well, some people baptize infants. They sprinkle a little water on them. Some people don't sprinkle water on infants. They wait till the child is a little older and they pour oil over their head. Some people don't, some churches don't pour oil once. They pour oil three times over the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, I heard a very <laughs> interesting one. It was called rose petal baptism. One pastor said, I want to make baptism special. And he picked rose petals, put them in a pail, and poured them over kids' heads and said they were baptized. Rose petal baptism. You know, one of the most unique ones I ever heard was this. It was called snow baptism. A pastor took his kids out, and he buried them in the snow. And he said it was baptism. Some of his members challenged him on it, and he said it doesn't make any difference whether the water is a solid or a liquid. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight... The Bible does tell us that the way you're baptized makes a significant difference because of the symbol. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Let's look at it. Read it together. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many lords are there? One. Who is he? The Lord Jesus Christ. How many kinds of faith are there? One faith, that's biblical religion. How many kinds of baptism are there? There's one true method of baptism tonight. And when you understand the meaning of baptism, you understand the significance of that method of baptism. Well, Jesus gives us the model of true biblical baptism. And how was Jesus baptized? 
Let's go and look at our model, Jesus Christ. And let's discover how Jesus was baptized. The Bible says, Mark 1, verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, obviously, if Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, it's because the method of baptism is not sprinkling or pouring, but it's full immersion. The Bible tells us why John was baptizing in Jordan. Read it with me, please, and tell me why John was baptizing in Jordan. It's John chapter 3, verse 23. Let's read it together. Now, John also was baptizing in Aon near Salem. That's a part of Jordan River. We continue. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So why was John baptizing in that part of the Jordan River by Salem? Because there was what? much water. So true biblical baptism requires that you have to have much water because you are being immersed. Now, when Jesus was baptized, what happened when Jesus was baptized here in the Jordan River? What took place at his baptism? Baptism is more than a symbol. When you're baptized, God moves in your life in very, very powerful, very dramatic ways. John, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him. So he went down into the water, and he came up what? Out of the water. He was immersed. Then the Bible says, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God came from heaven. The Bible also says that a voice came from heaven. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that two things happened when Christ was baptized. A voice came from heaven, said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well, well pleased. When you walk into the water and are baptized, you may not hear an audible voice from heaven, but in your heart, God is saying to you, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. It's a wonderful thing to please your father. Wonderful thing to please your mother. But it's another thing to know that you're going into that baptismal pool and you are pleasing God. As you walk into that baptismal pool, you sense it in your heart. You say, Jesus, I'm doing this for you. You walk into the baptismal pool and you hear that voice in your heart. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Then the Bible says that a spirit of God like a dove came upon Jesus. But wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary? Didn't the Holy Spirit guide Jesus through his childhood? Didn't the Holy Spirit keep Jesus in times of temptation? Why does the Bible say that the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus as a dove at the time of his baptism? Because at the time of Jesus' baptism, he was declaring war on Satan. At the time of his baptism, he'd begin his three-and-a-half-year ministry. So the Holy Spirit came to empower him at that time and strengthen him. When you step into the water to be baptized and you open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm weak, but you're strong. Jesus, cleanse me from my sin. Jesus, make me over again. Jesus, make me new. When you do that and you step into that water, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he strengthens you. He gives you power and strength. Do you see why the devil doesn't want you to be baptized? You see why the devil doesn't want you to make that decision? Because he does not want you to have in your heart the sense that you're pleasing God and the assurance you're God's child. Why doesn't the devil want you to make that decision? Because he does not want you to open your life fully to God because he knows the Spirit of God will come into your life and the chains will be broken and you can live new life in Christ. Baptism is not only a symbol that have accepted Christ, but in the service itself we open our heart and the Spirit of God touches our lives and changes them and renews them. When I was in Geneva, Switzerland, we went to the... World Council of Churches. As I walked through the door here, I noticed something amazing. A fresca from the third century, fourth century actually, fourth century, from a church in Africa. And it's the earliest fresca we have of Christ's baptism. And here it is. Christ being fully immersed in the Jordan. Fully immersed. And it's one of the earliest frescas we have. Truly, baptism is by immersion. It is a marvelous symbol. Believers down through the centuries have experienced the joy of making a full commitment to Christ through baptism. When the Apostle Paul preaches, he talks about baptism by immersion. Philip was led to 
the Ethiopian, and Philip immersed that Ethiopian. This is a very fascinating and incredible story. Philip is preaching over in Samaria. The Holy Spirit comes upon him and leads him down to a road that is going from Jerusalem to Africa through Egypt, and it is called the Gaza Road. As Philip is led to this Ethiopian, he finds the Ethiopian, a very wealthy man, a very intelligent man, who is the treasurer to the queen. And this man has been up to Jerusalem to worship, and he's reading the prophecies in the book of Isaiah. And as he reads those prophecies, he doesn't understand them. He's reading about Jesus. And Philip comes alongside of him, and Philip explains the prophecies, and the Ethiopian accepts Jesus. As he does, the eunuch says, see here is water, one hinders me from being baptized. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit. When I'm standing at the door here at each night greeting people and you come out the door and people say, what hinders me? I want to be baptized. I know the Holy Spirit's working. When people send me emails from throughout the country and say, Pastor Mark, you talked about baptism. I want to be baptized. The Holy Spirit is doing something. Hundreds are making their decision to follow Christ. Hundreds are making their decisions to be baptized. There seems to be a sense that this is the time. The Ethiopian says, what hinders me from being baptized? The Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The Ethiopian responds this way, and he says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Philip takes him down into the water, so Philip commands the chariot to stand still, and the, the, the Ethiopian and Philip go down into the water, and he baptizes them. True Bible baptism, the candidate and the one doing the baptizing walk into the water. The one doing the baptizing raises his hand and says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The candidate is lowered into the water, totally covered in that sense that he's cleansed from sin. And the Spirit of God comes upon him. You know, the Ethiopian was the only one in his family that became a Christian and a follower of Jesus. The Ethiopian had nobody else that we know of in Ethiopia, the only one in his country. It always takes one to step out for Christ. If you are the only one in your family, make that decision. If you are the only one in your neighborhood, make that decision. If you are the only one in your country, make that decision. There may be people watching me in countries in the world that have, that have prohibit Christianity from publicly baptizing. God understands that. But wherever you are, make that decision, and as soon as you possibly can, look for that opportunity, and God will open that door. But I thank God that here in America, we live in a land of freedom. I have received an email from a country and in that country, the lady said to me, Pastor, I do not know one other Sabbath-keeping Adventist Christian. Pastor, I would long to be baptized. Every time you make an appeal, I raise my hand, I want to be. But in my country, it's forbidden by death. I say to you tonight, if you are watching by television, if you are here in this church, if you are watching over the internet and you are in America and it's a land of the free and you haven't made your decision, think of those that want to make it but they cannot because they may be headed if they do and say, Jesus Christ, I'm going to stand for you here and I'm going to walk into that water and make my decision and publicly testify for Christ. What do you say here tonight, Orlando? Yeah. We have that opportunity, and God is calling us to make that decision for Christ. The truths about baptism, the Ethiopian accepted Christ. He accepted the teachings of Christ. The Ethiopian's baptism indicated that he would stand alone if necessary, but you never stand alone because you stand with Jesus. And he would make a public stand. The Ethiopian and Philip went into the water together. That's true Bible baptism. The Ethiopian was fully immersed in the waters of baptism. God is moving and leading men and women today to make that decision. Baptism, what does it mean? There's a Greek word, it's called baptizo. Can you say it together? What's the word? Baptizo. baptizo. We get our English from that. That wasn't, that was pretty good for the first try, but let's do it a little better. Baptizo. You got it? Let's go. Baptizo. 
Good emphasis. It means to dip, to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle. It means to plunge underneath the water. This word baptizo was used in Greek literature, the language of the New Testament, for a woman who was dyeing a piece of cloth, and if she had it white and she wanted it to be blue, purple, or another color, royal blue, she would totally immerse it. That's baptizo. You must be immersed. Why is immersion the way? Well, because my feet have led me astray, they must go under. My hands have reached out and uh, they have sinned, they must go under. I've sinned with my eyes, they must go under. I've sinned with my mouth, it must go under. The heart, the mind, the entire person must be immersed, symbolizing the total cleansing of the magnificent grace of Christ. Now, it wasn't until the Council of Ravenna, which is a Roman council in A.D. 1311, that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. Many practices have come into the Christian church that do not find their basis in the Bible. Sunday came in. It was a pagan practice that came into the church, sun worship. The idea that the soul is immortal came into the Christian church. No foundation in the Word of God. The Bible says the death is but asleep until the resurrection. The idea that what you eat and drink doesn't make any difference, that came in. Pagan philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die. Many practices came in. Infant baptism or sprinkling slipped into the Christian church. There were pagan religions called mystery religions that actually sprinkled, you see. That came into the Christian church. Here's how it came in. The church practiced the true baptism for it over a thousand years. In 1311, this Catholic council, Council of Ravenna, said, look, there are many people that put off baptism until death. And they knew what the Bible says. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so because people put off baptism at death, the pre until death, the priest would come, he would wrap them in wet cloths from head to toe. And uh, at the time of death, because he couldn't bring them to be immersed. And so he would wrap them in those wet cloths. As time went on, they said, look, Rather than take people who are dying and wrap them with wet cloths, why don't we just sprinkle every baby and guarantee their baptism? They did that largely because of the idea of a doctrine called original sin. And original sin says that every baby is condemned to eternal death or condemned because of Adam's sin. And if they're not sprinkled or baptized, they will not enter into heaven. What kind of God would we serve if he condemned a baby to death for something that Adam did and something the mother did not do. Are we condemned because of Adam's sin? Yes, we are. But Jesus Christ came to redeem us from the death that came about as the result of Adam's sin. And what is baptism? It is not magical sprinkling with something mystical that's supposed to take away sin at birth. It is coming to the conclusion that Christ did die for my sin as well as Adam's sin. And that when I look at that cross, I say, Jesus, that grace is mine. Jesus, that mercy is mine. I look at that cross and I say, Lord, I want to be one of yours. I want to follow you. What is baptism? It's saying, I understand you, God's word. You have a plan for my life. And I want to follow the teachings of your word. I want to be a disciple of Christ and a Christian. So something that was precious like baptism something that was meaningful for believers to accept Christ and become part of the family of God was changed to sprinkling and it became something that didn't find its roots in the Word of God and didn't find its roots in Scripture. What's the meaning of Bible baptism? You ask the question, when I walk into the water, what's the meaning? What's the biblical significance? What can I look forward to as I anticipate baptism? The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, verse three and four, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what, everybody? Death. So baptism is baptism into Christ's death. But then the Bible says, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And it continues that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So baptism is a symbol of three things. Here they are. It's a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. When I walk into the baptismal pool, when you walk into the baptismal pool, you are saying, I'm dying to the old sinful way of life. 
That does not mean you will never sin again. I have people say to me, well, if I'm baptized, does that mean I'm perfect and do I have to be perfect before I'm baptized? If people had to be perfect before they would be baptized, nobody would be baptized, right? What does it mean when, we, when the Bible says we die to the old sinful way of life? It means this. Sin as a way of life is no more part of our life. We have turned from a life of sin to a life committed to Jesus Christ. So we walk into the baptismal pool, we say, Lord, I want to die to this old way of life. I want a new life in Jesus. As we go under the water, the Bible says you're buried. We are buried. We are saying, Lord, symbolically, I want my past life to be buried. I want the guilt, the condemnation, the shame of the past to be buried. And Lord, I want to rise up to the new walk and the new life in Christ. Have you ever felt, I wish my past could be buried? I wish I could go back and live some years over again. Have you ever felt, Lord, I just wish that, I wish that I didn't feel the guilt for what I did three years ago or four years ago. I wish that was all gone. When you walk into the baptismal pool, that old person dies. And the devil comes up and he says, six months later after your baptism, nine months later, look what you did before your baptism, six months before. Look what you did a year before. And what happens? You say, Lord, that old person did what? That old person is dead, and you cannot condemn a dead person. And you say, Satan, be gone, because that person died in the baptismal pool. You say, I walked into the water. I was plunged under the water. As I went under, that sense of cleansing, when you come up out of that water, the Bible says there is newness of life. You come up with a smile on your face. You come up with a sparkle in your eyes. You come up with peace in your heart. You come up with the assurance that you are Christ and your hand is in the hand of Jesus Christ. The past is buried. There is a new life in Jesus. You say, I wish, you know, it's one thing to get a new pair of shoes. It's one thing to get a, 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 a new sport coat. It's one thing to get a new dress. It's another thing to get a new what? Life. And Jesus says, you walk into the water. The peace of God will flow into your heart, and you'll have a new life in Jesus Christ. Baptism does not mean you are perfect. It means you're committed. I've had people say to me, well, Pastor Mark, I don't know if I should be baptized because maybe I'll sin after I'm baptized. I say, look, you'll sin a lot more before you're baptized. Because the devil will keep you falling and falling and falling and make you feel you're unworthy. So make your commitment to Christ. Open your heart to him. Watch his power and grace come into your life and watch him transform your life. See, baptism isn't the end of the Christian life. It's a beginning. It's a beginning of a new adventure with Jesus. We've come to Christ. We have studied his word. We believe we've found his truth. We want to obey his commandments be part of his Sabbath-keeping Adventist people, and we make that decision to move ahead. Baptism gives you a new sense of freedom. You see, you say, Lord, there's a power greater than the power of bondage that's been holding me. And you walk into the water, and you have this sense of peace. You have this sense of freedom. I'm letting go. I'm not managing my own life. I'm not running my own life. I'm letting go. There's freedom in Jesus. Baptism gives us a new sense of spiritual power in our lives because we, re we do receive that added power of the Holy Spirit. The more you commit your life to Christ, the more he's going to give you a greater power in your life. Now, what happens when we're baptized? I have seen thousands and thousands and thousands of people walk through those waters. And, and when they come, what happens? What promises does God make when we're baptized? Well, the first promise God makes is this, that our sins are forgiven. The Bible uses the word remission of sins. Now, often people don't understand that, and they say, Pastor Mark, I thought our sins were forgiven when we confess them. They are. You don't have to wait to be baptized to get your sins forgiven. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins. But have you remembered to confess every sin? Have you remembered to confess every time you're selfish? Have you remembered to confess every time you're greedy? Have you remembered to confess every time that uh, you had a critical tongue? No, not at all. When we walk into the water to be baptized, here's what we do. We say, Lord, I want you to consider my whole past life sin. And the sins I confessed... I want those to be gone, but those hidden scars in my mind, that hidden bitterness or anger and resentment, that, 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 that those scars, I want them to be gone, Lord, and I'm walking into the baptismal pool, and Lord, I want every sin to be gone in the past. The Bible says in Acts 2, verse 38, read it with me, please. Let's read together. 
Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice the Bible is very plain. It says, let what? What's this word? Every one of you. So the Bible encourages, commands, instructs every one of us to be baptized for the what? Remission of sins. I've seen people walk through those waters and they come up out of the water and they have this sense of joy in their life. Why? Because they have this sense that the sins of the past are covered with the blood of Christ and that they've entered into the grace of God and baptism is the testimony of that that they make when they make this decision. Secondly, at baptism, the Holy Spirit is given to us in a marked special way. Now, earlier we read about the Holy Spirit being given to Jesus at his baptism. Does the Holy Spirit come upon us at baptism as well as Jesus, or did this, was this something that just especially happened to Jesus? The Bible says in Acts 2, verse 38 and 39, Then Peter said to them, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We read that. And you shall receive what? the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, who was that gift for? Was it just for those in Jesus' day? Just for those in the day of Pentecost? For the promise, now the promise, is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. We are far off from Pentecost, but God has made us a what? A promise. Can God lie? God will never lie. Is there anything God cannot do? <laughs> Is there anything God cannot do? God cannot lie. Why can't he lie? Because if he lied, he wouldn't be God. God cannot lie. So all God's promises are true. And God promises. When you go into that baptismal pool and you say, Lord, I want my sins cleansed, he promises that through his grace, they are God. He promises to give you his gift of the Holy Spirit to empower you to be his child even now in my life. I was baptized when I was 17 years old by immersion. You know, because of my upbringing in the Roman Catholic Church, I was baptized, in, not baptized, but sprinkled as a baby. And I didn't know it, of course, as many watching didn't know it, and I was sprinkled as a baby. But as I studied these Bible truths and learned that I could walk into the water declaring my commitment to Christ, as I learned that baptism was a symbol, that I've, I, I've come to Jesus and I've found the truth of his word and I could open my heart to the Holy Spirit. When I was 17 years old, I was baptized by immersion. Even today, I claim the promise that God gave me on my baptismal day. If I'm facing unusual temptations today in my life, over 45 years later, I say, God, when I was baptized, you promised you'd never leave me or forsake me. When I was baptized, I made a commitment to you, and you made a commitment to me, God, that you would empower me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm going to preach in Africa. I want to be powered by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm preaching in South America. I want to be powered by the Holy Spirit. God, that's a promise you made to me, and I claim that promise today. If you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, you claim that promise of the Holy Spirit. And if you have not yet walked through that water to be immersed, God has a marvelous gift for you in the ministry and baptism of the Holy Spirit. When God calls you to baptism and you're cleansed, he promises to give you the gift of the Spirit to empower your life. He promises to move in your life in special ways. Thirdly, not only is every sin forgiven, not only is the Spirit given to us, but we are adopted in God's family. When we are baptized, people say to me, Pastor Mark, when I'm baptized, I don't want to join any church. I just want to be united to Christ. And I say, wait a minute. The Bible says Jesus is the head, the church is the body. You can't cut the head off the body. We are united to Christ through his body on earth. And uh, when we're baptized, the Bible says we're, ba we're united to the family of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received God's word. What did these people do? They gladly received God's word. And that day there were 3,000 souls added to them. When you gladly receive God's word and understand God's truth, it's time to move ahead in Bible baptism. Now, when you're baptized, do you join a church? What does the Bible say? What happened when those were baptized on the day, in, day of Pentecost in Acts? Acts 2, verse 42. 
they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So the people that were baptized understood the apostles' doctrine. They understood what the Bible taught. They continued in the fellowship, that is, in worship and in church, and in the breaking of bread, communion, social meals, and in prayers. So four things. When they were baptized, they followed the apostles' doctrine. They understood the Bible. When they were part of the fellowship of the Word of God, they worshiped. They were part of the church. They were part of a social life, and they celebrated communion, and they were part of prayer ministry and prayer groups. The Bible says that when they were baptized, the Lord added to the what? Church daily, such as should be saved. It's one thing to be baptized and left as a spiritual orphan. Sometimes our babies left on the streets. Sometimes our babies brought back to the hospital and left there. They are. When you, when you are a baby and you don't have opportunity to grow in a family, growth is much more difficult. Babies are meant to grow in families. When we come to Jesus and we're baptized, we become part of the family of God. We become part of the church and we're nurtured in the word so we grow and we grow to understand more of that word and we grow to understand more of Jesus and more of his love and more of his grace. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, for by one spirit we're all baptized into one what? Body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've been all made to drink into one spirit. We're baptized into one body. What is that body that we're baptized into? What does the Bible call the body of Christ? Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the what? The church. So when we're baptized, we come to Jesus. We understand the word of God, and we're baptized, we become part of his church. What church? Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we're baptized in a Christ-centered, Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping church as Jesus commanded. He said, Go you therefore into all the nations. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you. So in the true biblical sense, baptism is by immersion into Christ and becoming part of the fellowship of God's people, his Sabbath-keeping Adventist people around the world. Should a person ever be rebaptized? What if you were baptized once by immersion? Should you ever be rebaptized? The Bible tells a very fascinating story. It tells the story of Philip coming to the upper coasts here in Ephesus. And he met a group of people that were already baptized by immersion by John. And it's quite fascinating as you look at the story. Acts 19, verse 2 to 5. And he says to them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? They respond back to him. So they said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now here are people that were baptized by immersion, but they hadn't yet heard that there was even a Holy Spirit. They didn't understand one of the central Bible teachings or doctrines. There are people that come to my meetings. They don't understand. They're wonderful, lovely Christians. Many of them keep the first day of the week. They don't understand one of the commandments of God that was written by God's finger on tables of stone, the Sabbath. There are many people that, that come to the meetings and they don't understand something as important as the fact that when we die, we rest until the resurrection. Uh, they have the idea of the immortal soul. There are people that come to the meetings. They don't understand the truth about the second coming of Christ, that every eye will hear it, every, ear will, every, every eye will see it, every ear will hear it. They don't understand significant truths. And as they come, they're impressed by the Holy Spirit. John baptized by immersion, but these people hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. We go on, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? They said John's baptism. In other words, we we're immersed by John. Then Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, Christ, who, who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So here are people baptized by John that were told that John pointed them forward to something else, that is, the coming of Jesus. They hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. What happened to these people and this group? When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
They had already been immersed by John since they didn't hear about the Holy Spirit, and that was a central Bible truth. And since John pointed them forward to something greater in the future, the coming of Jesus, they were rebaptized. They did not deny their baptism by John, but they had accepted further truth. There are many lovely Christians. They love Jesus with all their heart. But when they hear the greater truths that the Bible has to offer, they choose to be rebaptized, not to deny their first baptism, but as a symbol of their desire to follow further truth. That is not forced upon them or mandated by the Bible, but it's an option that they have, if, and we have the precedent in the Bible, to be rebaptized. Now, why then would people make that decision to be rebaptized? First, this group in Paul's day was baptized by immersion by John. They were rebaptized by Paul because they heard further truth, and that truth was so significant. So, an individual may be desire to be rebaptized if they're committed Christians, but they've discovered the truth of God's word, they desire to be part of God's commandment keeping people. Many thousands around the world are making that decision. Secondly, there may be people that once turned from a world of sin, they are committed Christians, they once turned, they were truly converted, they were baptized, but they slipped away, they went into apostasy against God. They drifted away from Jesus a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Now don't misunderstand me. You're not rebaptized every time you sin. But if you once knew Christ, you were immersed, but you drifted far, far away. It's just like you don't get remarried every time you have an argument with your wife. But let's suppose somebody leaves their wife and they're gone five years and the marriage is dissolved. And then they come back and they realize what they've done. Sometimes Christians are baptized and they drift far away from Jesus. If they desire to come back, they were once baptized, they departed from Christ, now they long to return. They say, Lord, I want to have a demarcation line with my past. I want to walk through the water and be baptized. They walk through the water again. They go under the water. They come down and they come up to live a new life in Christ and that past is behind them. They sense the power of the living God in their life. They sense what Jesus is doing. How important is Bible baptism to God? What does the Bible say? How important is baptism? The Bible is very plain. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. John 3 verse 5. Jesus said most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of what? Water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of the Spirit, you're transformed from where? Within. Born of water, you're baptized. Somebody said, wait a minute, what about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross, the first thing he would have done was come down and be baptized if he could have. God isn't talking about people that are physically incapable. But he's saying that baptism is an important symbol in the Christian life. Baptism says, I'm taking a stand. The Bible says in Mark 16, verse 16, Who, he that believes and is baptized will be what? Saved. So baptism is the outgrowth of belief. When I believe and accept Jesus, I move ahead. I was preaching in the country of Poland. We were down in the Leningrad Theater, a theater dedicated to Lenin, downtown. Mrs. Uberhofer, the lady here, was coming to the meetings. This is her son, Peter. This is Peter's wife, this is his child, and this is Peter's mother-in-law. And Mrs. Uberhofer would say to me, Pastor Mark, pray for my boy. Pray for my boy, Pastor Mark. My boy has an altar in our home, and it's an altar to Hitler. He believes that Hitler is supreme. He worships Hitler. He has Hitler icons, Hitler pictures, he, he's given his life to that satanic cult of Hitlerism. Pray for my boy. This boy got a brain tumor, cancer in the brain. They operated on him, cut him straight down the head. Cancer was inoperable. Still, there was cancer there. After they took out part of the tissue, the cancer continued to grow. They operated a second time. He didn't find in his satanic rituals any comfort or peace. He began listening to the tapes that we had. In those days, we had cassette audio tapes. He began listening to him. He listened to the tape about Jesus. 
And he said, I want my whole life to be changed. I want my whole life to be changed. I need Jesus. I need the peace of Christ. He accepted Jesus. He continued listening to the tapes. He sensed Jesus was coming again. He listened to the tapes and accept the truth about Jesus and obedience in Christ. And as he listened to 25 tapes and he began to read some, his mother called me one day. I was in Poland and she said, Pastor Mark, would you come to our house? The doctor is here. He told me, Peter has two hours to live. Would you come? He's going to die today. Pastor Mark, he hasn't eaten for about two and a half weeks. He tried to drink tea today and just a few crackers and he's just vomiting and vomiting and vomiting. Pastor Mark, would you come? I came. When I got there, he was vomiting, vomiting his stomach out. And he just kept vomiting this green mass from his stomach. And I knelt on the floor and held a basin before him. And he vomited for about 20 minutes. I hugged him and held him in my arms. And he looked me in the eye. We were face to face. I saw the seeds of death in his eyes. And he said, Pastor Mark, the one thing I want in my life is for you to baptize me. The one thing I want in my life is for you to baptize me. I want to go under the water. I want to know I'm cleansed. And I said, Peter, Jesus accepts you. Your sins are forgiven. I can't baptize you. I can't take you to the church. You're going to die. I can't take you to the river. He looked at me and he said, Pastor Mark, this is the wish of a dying boy. Would you please baptize me? I said to his mother, fill the bathtub with water as high as you can. I stripped him down to his waist and carried him in my arms. I carried him in my arms. And I carried him to the baptistry, the bathtub, and I knelt on the floor and baptized him, lowered him in the water. It was as if the presence of God was there. When I lifted him up out of the water, dried him off, and I hugged him, and we hugged, and I was soaking wet, and he was crying, and I was crying, and I, I took him to a chair, sat him down, and we prayed, and he said, Mother, I want tea. And she brought him tea immediately. He said, Mother, could I have some crackers? And he ate. He didn't die that day, and he didn't die the next day, and he didn't die the next day. And he lived for a month. After a month, he closed his eyes in sleep and wait, is waiting now for the resurrection. But let me give you a message from a dying boy. And this is what the dying boy said. If he could be here today, this is what he would say to you. There is no reason to wait. Move ahead, follow Jesus, be baptized. It'll be the happiest day of your life. His mother wrote to me just a few weeks ago, about three or four weeks ago. She saw one of these programs where I used the illustration of Peter, and she said, Pastor Mark, I tell you, that last month after he was baptized was the happiest day of his life. The Spirit of God is saying to you, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Around the world, God is calling men and women. Moscow, Olympic Stadium, Moscow, Kremlin Palace, hundreds, thousands of former communists coming to Christ to be baptized here in the Olympic swimming pool. God is doing something around the world tonight. Thousands are coming. Young Russians that were atheists coming to Jesus Christ. There is a movement around the world. The Holy Spirit of God is moving tonight. The Rizal Stadium in the Philippines, 1,300 in one day, they came with the pastors in the water baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. God is moving around the world tonight. This is no common time. This is no ordinary time. Ghana, they came, 20,000 were baptized there in our meetings, the Spirit of God was poured out and we saw Jesus moving all through that country in marvelous satellite meetings like this. Wherever you are tonight, Orlando, God is speaking to you. Jesus wants to give you his joy, his love, his grace, his forgiveness. Jesus wants to speak to you tonight. Romania, former communist swimming pool. Three ladies here came in their wedding dresses. A mother, about 48, and her, her, her two girls, 23, 24 years old, they said, we want to be married to Christ tonight. They actually walked in the baptismal pool in their wedding dresses because they said, Jesus, we want to be yours. Jesus, we want to follow you. In many Hindu lands tonight, thousands and tens of thousands are coming to Jesus Christ tonight. Would you like to say, Jesus, I'm yours? Wherever you are tonight, here in Orlando, 
I'm going to pass out a special card. I hope that every one of you will take this card in your hand. You may be a baptized Adventist member. Take the card in your hand and write a little prayer request on the card. You may be, never have been baptized before, and the Spirit of God is speaking to you tonight, and you want to say, I want to check the box. I want to look forward to being baptized. You may have drifted away, and God's calling you to be rebaptized tonight. Those of you who are watching as these cards are being filled out, I'm going to ask you to make that decision. Just bow your head where you are. You're in that living room by yourself. You've never followed Christ and were baptized. You're in a church tonight. Just bow your head right now, wherever you are, to make this decision for Jesus. Just take this card, whoever you are. If you need a pen, please take it. Jesus is speaking to you, balcony. God's talking to you there. Men and women throughout this audience that'll say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to be baptized. Men and women throughout this audience will say, I've drifted away. This is my hour. This is my time. I want to come back to Christ. If you are an Adventist Christian here tonight, you're already baptized, write a little prayer request on the back of that card for somebody else. Turn your card in because we're going to gather these and pray. If you have cards in the local churches where you are tonight, wherever you are, pass out your cards. But friend of mine, at the end of this meeting tonight, I'm going to invite those who filled out their cards to join me in a great prayer service. And so wherever you are tonight, you can make this decision in your heart. You can make this decision in your mind. Charles is going to come out. Sing one verse of the song, Just As I Am, wherever you are tonight. Take a moment and fill out your card. What's this card say tonight? First line says, I believe baptism is by immersion. If you believe that, check the card. Second card says, I want to be baptized soon. Check that box. Third, card sa third line says, I want to be rebaptized. If that's you, check that box. Last, I want to unite with God's commandment-keeping people. Just take a moment now, wherever you are, listen to Charles sing. If you're someplace and you don't have a card, you can make that decision in your heart right now. Charles, sing a verse of Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea but Tonight, do you sense the Spirit of God working in your life? Is God leading you to make a significant decision in your life? Wherever you are, open your heart to this Christ. Our ushers are going to pass the buckets across right now to collect the cards. When we make a decision to follow Christ in baptism, we are saying, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I love you with all my heart. I believe I found the truth of your word. I want to be part of your Sabbath-keeping, commandment-keeping people. I want to unite with those around the world that are making this decision. Lord, this is my desire. This is my heart cry. This is my plea. Tonight, as the buckets are being passed across, I'm going to invite you to stand with me in prayer. Wherever you are just now, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Here locally, I invite you to stand with me. Wherever you are tonight, the ushers in Orlando are going to come forward. You may be in a church tonight. You may be here in Orlando tonight. You may be in the balcony tonight. As the ushers are coming forward, just come forward and face this way, ushers. If you checked a card for baptism, I want you to come forward and I'm going to pray for you. You checked a card for baptism, come forward, I want to pray for you. In the balcony, you just come to the front of the balcony. Wherever you are tonight, wherever you are tonight, you come forward, face me here, and we're going to pray tonight. 
wherever you are, at the screen, you come to that screen in the church, you kneel down in your house, wherever you are, thousands are going to come. Just come right up to the altar, folk. Come right up. Charles is going to sing. Wherever you are tonight, if the Spirit of God is touching you, if you want to be baptized, hundreds, thousands are going to come. All over the world, they're going to come. Wherever you are, just come out of your, your pew there. In the balcony, there are those of you that want to look forward to ba baptism. You come to the front of the balcony. They're coming here in Orlando. Wherever you are tonight, press in close so others can, can come. And Charles, sing a verse, just as I am. If we go off the air where you are, you come forward where you are as Charles sings. You come forward to that screen wherever you are. Wherever you are here, if the Spirit of God moves in your heart, you come and join this group. Maybe you checked the card, maybe you didn't. But there will be hundreds that will follow Christ. Just come, just now, as Charles sings. We'll pray for you. Just as I am and we There are those tonight that are thinking about this decision. You may be watching by satellite, you may be here. It's a decision you're struggling with. You sense God leading you, but it's hard to step out. If you want me to pray for you, you're not quite ready to make the decision, but you want me to pray for you, that God will give you that courage. There are some of you that are thinking, I've got a problem in my life. I just can't handle it. It's too big. You step out for Jesus and pray. We're going to go off the air momentarily. Coordinators in the local sites, you help the people coming forward. You pray with them. You talk to them tonight. If you're in your house right now, get on your knees. Make this commitment to Jesus. If you're in a country that prohibits baptism, tell Jesus, Lord, open the way for me. Open the way for me. God bless you, but tonight here.